I got money on my mind. I'm just trying to get some dough. I ain't picking up my lot unless it's money on the phone. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Black Wolf Renaissance Podcast. Your boy, David Bella, one-fourth of the Black Wolf Renaissance, checking on my co-host for the episode. Jalen, how you feeling, bro? What's good, y'all? It's your boy, Jalen, man. Another quarter of the Black Wealth Renaissance, man. Feeling good, feeling great on this lovely Saturday, yes, man. Indeed. The energy going crazy. We just got done talking with my brother, man, my dog. Hey, when I say I'm ready to get Precious. this... Ready to get this thing started, bro. But before we get started, let's just welcome everybody. Man, thank y'all for coming in and listening. Please mm-hmm. leave us a rate and review. Uh, share this podcast. If you're a new listener, thank you. Thank you for coming in. You're about to have a great time. If you're an old listener, appreciate you for always rocking with us. Yes, indeed, man. Like my brother was saying, this episode about to be great. This episode, for one, is long overdue, y'all. We got a, a great brother. We've been tapped in with him for a while. Uh, Hell yeah. He is the owner of Brand Resumes, a career coach and resume writing service. And as I just learned, he recently launched a SaaS service. So, man, called, I, I don't even want to say the name. I'm going to let my brother get into Brandon. I'm going to introduce, I guess, Brandon Mitchell. Brandon, how you doing, bro? Doing excellent, man. Blessed and highly favored. I just want to say thank y'all for the opportunity and also for what y'all are doing for the culture. I mean, this advice and guidance uh, and expertise is well needed as we push the uh, culture forward. So just very excited to be here uh, beginning of the year. So for all the entrepreneurs and everybody else who's trying to get it, you know, this is the time to really get straight to it. Um, you know, we just, we're just really blessed and uh, it's about working hard. Hey, man. Appreciate you for taking some time out your Saturday. Yes, Come and kick it with us, my dog. Um, and we'll just get right started. Just get right on into it um, for everybody who's not interested who is Brandon and how'd you get started with brand resumes? It's a great question. So for everybody who doesn't know who I am, my name is Brandon Mitchell, founder and CEO of brandresumes.com, serial entrepreneur as I do a lot of things. Um, and, you know, I really started my journey uh, way back when, but, but before we jump into that, um, I think it's important to talk about where I came from. So uh, originally born and raised uh, on Long Island, New York. So I'm from Uniondale. I went to Uniondale High School, uh, one of six. So I have a ton of <laughs> brothers and sisters, Jamaican American. Um, and so for me, you know, it was really just um, figuring out what I wanted to do with, with my life. And I think, you know, I'll take it back, you know, way back when to when I was in high school, it was something that uh, figuring out, you know, careers and just opportunities. It's like a lot of times you have all these outside voices, whether it's your parents or your guidance counselor trying to tell you what you want to do. Um, but for me, I just wanted, I knew that I wouldn't study finance, wanted to be in business. And I think that resonates with a lot of people because a lot of times, you know, when you're coming from a background that you don't really see a lot of wealth and you don't see a lot of prosperity, it's like, Whatever's going to pay me, let me know, and I'm going to jump into it. And so I decided to study uh, finance. Uh, that's what I went to college for. So I went, I went and studied um, at, the, at the State University of New York at Plattsburgh. So originally, like I said, from New York, wanted to keep it local. Uh, but honestly, I just wanted to get as far away from my hometown as I could. Because <laughs> um, a lot of times you stay local, it's great, but having that exposure. Mm-hmm. And so I um, decided to go and study uh, at Plattsburgh Finance, jumped in as, as a freshman. And, you know, that's what really, you know, set it off and I changed my life because going to college, it was like one of those things where, you know, you get exposed to so many different personalities. It's very diverse. Um, and just being, you know, uh, a, a really uh, a, a minority on campus um, was just a really different experience. And so started there um, and I was able to, to do a lot while I was an undergrad um, and then really realized that there was a bigger opportunity for me and, and a play. Um, because on campus you have, it's like the world's your oyster, right? So when you get in as a freshman, you really don't know what's going on. There's just a lot of different things you could do. And actually you could get trapped up, you know, it's the partying and, and the girls and everything is, is always good. And I did my fair share, but it, it was really when I realized that um, when I was going back to uh, home, right? That like that, that first year uh, as a freshman, you know, you go away from home. I remember a conversation that I had with, with my mother and it was like, you know, um, she was like, yeah, like you're coming back. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna come back home to be able to you know kick it and she was like well I'm, I'm i'm actually moving and i was like what you mean you're moving so we're all moving and uh lo and behold i found out that um when i was gonna go back home she was when she said moving she meant just her and my younger siblings so you know freshman in college i'm like well what you mean like i don't got my room again so it, it ended up that uh she was gonna move and it was a blessing but it, it just made me realize very early on and i say i was like 18 19 that um i didn't have a place to live when i was gonna come back as a freshman so I needed to just make sure that whatever I was going to do or what I was going to pursue in college and I was going to really leverage this education was going to make sure that I could then stand on my own two feet and I didn't have to worry about, you know, somebody, you know, covering myself. And so always been a hustler, been working since I was 15, 
But that experience of just like realizing that, oh snap, like I might have to just make it on my own really changed my entire life. And I say, you know what? I don't care if I make $40,000 when I graduate or $100,000, I'm gonna make sure that I have a job um, in my hand that I can support myself. And so, you know, I ended up graduating college in three years uh, by the grace of God, I don't know how I did it. I went into overdrive, 26 credits a semester, 27 credits, seven classes, eight classes, joined a whole bunch of clubs and just really dove deep into just becoming a professional, had to, you know, coming from, you know, just a, a Marty background, just high school, where it was only just a bunch of uh, African-Americans just getting diverse, but I realized, okay, well, what's networking, what's relationship building and just immersed in that. Um, and just through the, the experience, I was able to land multiple internships, um, through just learning how to be a professional. I think a lot of times um, people don't teach you what a professional is when you come from a, a background um, that you don't see a lot of professionals per se, mm -hmm. but yeah, college and, and just do, jump, jumping into that, getting the internships, you know, learning about the branding, the resumes, the LinkedIn's and all that stuff really changed the trajectory. And then I also ended up graduating uh, 2017, three years with three degrees and through just learning how to be a good professional, learning everything and having college being my uh, stomping grounds I was able to le leverage and land a job um, at graduation, uh, $75,000 as a 21 year old jumping into the workforce. So that's mm -hmm. a little bit more about myself uh, and uh, just it's just how I started to get to where I'm at today. I love, I love it, bro. Yeah, I love to hear you, that, bro. You, like you said, the world is your oyster. And it, instead of letting that environment just like dictate, cause it's like you said, it's easy to get caught up in that stuff, man. It's very easy to get it's, distracted. We, we talked about that like in our very first episodes, like college is a place that the conversation opens up about is it, like everybody just talks about student debt, but they don't talk about the opportunities and the way you can really level yourself up there. And I love that you used it to to really create opportunities for yourself. And you mentioned something in there whenever you were talking about professionalism. I, I want to speak to that a little bit more yeah. because coming from my background as well, like I'm from the country, bro. I I just seen a lot of country niggas to be honest. Like it wasn't right. nobody that was really out your moving, moving like, and like like corporate like almost right so can we speak to like how you learn some of that stuff and how it affected your your ability to i guess like go get those internships and like start building out the relationship so that whenever you got out you were able to land that job absolutely and so when i when i remember back when i realized that i was gonna have to you know do everything necessary to make sure that i was going to be self-sustaining and self-sufficient and have money in my own pocket I realized that the only way that I could do that is by, you know, making sure that I could land a job and to land a job. And especially when you come from a non-target school. And for those of you who don't know, non-target means that you didn't go to like an Ivy League. You didn't go to a big name school where there's actually university recruiting teams at your school. It's a little known fact, depending on how big of a university you go, like a Syracuse or like a Brown or a Stanford or Cornell, the companies is there. So you just got to, you know, play your cards right, get a 3.0 or above, and you can just, you know, finagle your way or finesse your way into an actual job opportunity. And so you kind of get what you pay for. But for me, I went to non-target school. So I had to figure out a way and a strategy in which I was going to be able to break into the mold and get into a company. It didn't have to be big, but coming from a, a, a school where people weren't recruiting, you know, people, it wasn't like a big thing. And so I was like, all right, bet. So what do I have at my disposal? I was always a hustler. So I ended up starting a business. Um, in college, was my first business was called idea.com. And idea, the idea behind it was that it was going to be a social media network where uh, we could connect entrepreneurs and the creators and the thinkers. And it'll be a platform where people could share ideas, comment on ideas and help essentially um, ideate on someone else's ideas and you would get equity in that idea. So it was like a, it was a mesh between like a Facebook where you see like a newsfeed of different ideas and you can filter and then also like a Kickstarter where you could then like have like you could be an accredited investor or not and then be able to go ahead and um, invest in someone's idea. So I decided to create a business to put something on my resume, but then I also leveraged clubs, right? And so I was a part of the Accounting and Finance Association. Like I said, I was a finance major originally. And so jumping into the finance club, I was exposed to different topics like, okay, well, now we got to run club meetings every week. We got to plan for 30, 40 members. What are we going to talk about? What are we going to do? Um, and then you, we also did uh, company trips where once a semester, spring and fall, we would actually go into Manhattan because I was five hours away, all the way upstate New York by Montreal and Plattsburgh. Um, we would do a trip to down to the city and literally network with local alumni. And so by joining those clubs, I got access to be able to, you know, then get in front of networks who were at the big companies like the EYs of the world, um, like the Morgan Stanley's because they were alumni and there was a little bit of a network there. So when I was on those clubs, I was being able to not only build my resume and my uh, professional experience because now I'm interacting with, I'm a freshman. 
I'm interacting with seniors, juniors, and it's not just like, you know, what's going on, what's the, where, where's the party at? It's like, okay, well, this is what um, a career path for a financial analyst looks like. Well, this is what a career path for an accountant looks like. Well, this is what the big four is, the big four accounting firms. And so I ended up putting myself in an environment with people who had the same goals and, and aspirations with me. And I think that's one of the biggest things you got to surround yourself mm. around people who want to do what you're trying to do, right? Because if you keep your circle around people that don't have the same interest and you get real distracted. And so I was laser focused when I decided to be a professional. And by joining those clubs and leveraging those relationships, I was able to start breaking in. And then also I realized that each club on campus has an actual advisor who's typically, um, you know, a professor. And so I was able to tap into the advisors network and tap that person to, hey, like, do you know all the people who are, who are looking for um, X, Y, Z uh, interns and, and so on and so forth. And so by by breaking into the actual uh, club space, becoming on the e-board. So it's one thing to go to a club. It's another thing to be part of that executive leadership actually running the show. So mm-hmm. I said, you know, I'm not going to just stop at becoming a member. I'm going to become a treasurer, a, a secretary, because it just padded my resume. And I didn't even know that I was doing that. But over time, I was getting real comfortable. Next thing I knew, I was the, the kid on campus, freshman, who was literally helping seniors and juniors with their resumes, with their LinkedIn profiles, because it was like, I just started to just soak in the knowledge. I was like a sponge. Like, you put me in a room, I was just soaking up all the knowledge, doing the research when I went, when I went back to my dorm room. And that's kind of how it um, just unfolded. And so just jumping into the professional world, I mean, we were doing presentations on what's networking. And then there's also career fairs too that, you know, people use every semester. So I just jumped into the world of just, okay, well, what are the steps that I need to take to make sure that one, I can land a graduation because that was my goal. And um, I realized quickly early on is that you got the, you need the professional etiquette, you know, your emails, you know, how you address people. You don't just like email somebody like, hi, X, Y, Z. And it's even small stuff like that, that if you don't even have that type of professionalism and that etiquette, mm-hmm. that you won't even go anywhere. And so um, I just got my start real, real early because I had to. I felt like if I did not, you know, have a job by the time I graduated, it was going to be a problem. And so just that tenacity and that like feeling like your back is up against the wall and you have to make something happen. I think that's what pushed me to go ahead and just go so hard early on. And, you know, the business, it just helped as well, because now not only did I have, let's look at the resume, I had, you know, executive leadership. I had, you know, double major at that point. Um, I had a business on there that I was helping and kind of trying to do. So I was just doing a lot of different things and I didn't know it, but I was just building up my, uh, my, my, my personal brand. And one key thing that I realized that when you're trying to build your brand, it doesn't matter if it's digital or if it's in person, you should be telling everybody the same thing and giving off the same story. And mm. So that's essentially how I kind of started to get into it. Mm, man, that's really, really important and really, really impactful. Just all of the things that you said, I don't want people to kind of gloss over this, especially if it's a listener out there who might be in school right now, or you might be thinking about going to school. A lot of the things that my brother just said, it's a great way for you to navigate around campus. Um, If you're a freshman just starting off, like he said, join some of these clubs. There's plenty of clubs that you can join and that would be your best way to start learning about the school, honestly, because you have people that's been there before. They, you might be able to find someone who's in your major. They'll be, they're able, they'll be able to help you navigate, you know, okay, this might be the teacher you want to take. This might not be the teacher that you want to take. This is a a class that you really might want to get into because I gained a lot from this. And then that e-board that you talking about getting on the e-board is so so, so important because I was in clubs and stuff also in school. And I think that that is one of the most prominent things because whenever you take that e-board position, it shows that responsibility. Yes. It shows that Leadership. you're not just wanting to be a part of that. You actually taking on the responsibility and you're actually driving what's going on with mm-hmm. this club. Right. Now they, 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 they start to notice, Oh, this person isn't scared to be a leader. This person is mm-hmm. actually going to step up. And now you're going to have the Dean of students. Every time you walk around, Hey, Jalen, how, hey, yep. how are you doing? And like, yes, sir. once I, once I, once I figured that out, I was like, man, this is a whole different ball game, man. Yeah. Like, I remember like one time the student union was closed. I had left my book sack in there. And for some reason, it was uh, our, one of the counselors, she came by, she's like, hey, what you doing out here? I was like, I'm trying to get in because I left my books and I got to study for this test. She's like, oh, okay, I got you. Uh, let, let me uh, get my keys right quick. I'll help you in. And See, like, if just, you wouldn't help and you wouldn't have known exactly. her. Exactly. Right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, I, and I would just add that, you know, don't feel like, okay, whether, you know, club is big and, you know, that you can't get in, try and get in. And look, if you want to start a club that doesn't exist, start the club, 
right? Because now you're the president off rip. Mm -hmm. And so now you got that at, 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 the, at the top of your resume as well and what you've done. And so there's a lot of, a lot of times where um, there was clubs on campus that we wanted and I knew people who then started it. And one of the clubs that changed everything for me was a National Association of Black Accountants. Mm. And that club came to my school about like my, around my sophomore year. And one of my buddies, Leslie, he was the one that started the club and we was again in classes together. So I knew him. And when you bring a, a, a club like that, that has a national presence, like a, a, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a marketing association club, something like that, or like mm -hmm. a NACTUS, which is for um, entrepreneurs, you bring that, that club to a campus, you really are starting like a, a huge um, a effect where they're going to bring resources, they're going to start sending people from like the headquarters to kind of help, you know, grow in it and nurture the club on campus. And so when we did that, I mean, man, it was different because now we had, you know, access to something called the Eastern Regions Conference, where then, um, you know, every, I think, you know, every uh, fall or, or, or I think it was fall, you know, they did like a big event and there was like all the different student, you know, chapters across the East Coast was then flying down or driving down to like a big conference. And that's where I finally met PwC. Funny enough, I met them there um, because in the conference, they was doing like speed networking rounds and stuff like that, where you could essentially, with a big, big ballroom, I mean, the Deloitte's, the Morgan Stanley's, the Goldman Sachs, the EY's, the Deloitte's, everybody was there. And like speed networking. And I remember going in, I was a sophomore, I had my portfolio. Portfolio was, was critical. You know, you're, you're kind of like a little leather portfolio, you put your resumes in there. Um, and if you don't have one, you definitely need one of those for when, you know, outside op opens back up. But I remember it was like a speed networking. I, I talked to this one recruiter, Caitlin, and I was just telling her my story. She was like, you know what? Let me see your resume. She took my resume, looked at it, put it in and like, and it was crazy because like I kind of peeked her. She walked back to the desk. She had like two piles. So it was like this pile, it was that pile. And I was like, and I, it was this pile was a little smaller than that pile. And I was like, okay, she put me in the, in the small pile. I was like, I wonder what that pile is. Next thing I know, I got an email that night. You got an interview tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I was like, whoa. And this, mind you, this is a three-day conference. And it was just like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday type of thing. You go back to, to, to campus. So I got an interview. It was like, PwC would like to interview you, you know, for like this internship position. I even know what PwC stood for. <laughs> I had no, I had no idea. I just was at this conference. I was a sophomore. My GPA was like a 3.1. And I just remember the next day I had the interview and it was in that same kind of ballroom, one-on-one, -on -one, 10 minutes. And I remember walking in and um, again, I was a good student, but my, you know, when I was so far GPA, it was like a 3.1. It wasn't even cutting like 3.5, but I just remember that I walked into that interview and um, she was like, well, tell me about yourself. I told her about myself. And she was like, well, you know, I see that your, your GPA is like a 3.1. And I was just like, ma'am, respectfully, um, the reason why my GPA is 3.1 is because one, I'm a, I, I run a company on campus and then and also I'm trying to work on a company. I'm in all these clubs. And I was like, you know, to be honest, I feel like GPA is not just a, a factor of like someone's intelligence or, or their or their aptitude. And me saying that to her as a recruiter, she was like, you know what? You're so right. Next mm -hmm. thing I knew, I was on a third round interview. I was being flown out to PwC headquarters in New York City for the third round interview. And so it was a crazy thing, but I would not never got that opportunity had I not been part of a club, had I mm -hmm. not had the network of people who were starting clubs and being in the whole space. So I would say that it changed my life and um, ended up killing that thir a third round interview and then starting as, a, as an intern officially. And even as an intern, it was three rounds of interviews. Mm -hmm. So I would say that like, be, 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 be prepared, but you gotta put yourself in the room and you gotta make sure that when, when the opportunity presents itself, you need to be ready for it. And I was ready because again, I had the experience. I had started a company. So I had something on my resume. I, I had, I was already practicing networking on campus. So when it was time to interview, it was just go time. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And um, a lot of times people don't put themselves in the right position and they're scared. Things like that's corny, but it's not, it can really help you. And that's what really you know took it off and interned over the summer. And I mean, I'm talking about as an intern at a big four accounting firm, $27 an hour. And I wasn't oh, even man. doing nothing much. Come and for on, me, man. like I was making seven twenty five at Dunkin' Donuts back in Long Island. So, man, imagine that. Yeah, and that's how you know you start getting into student. this into this world and just changes, just change, it changes everything. And I, I kind of want to talk about another point that you said earlier. You was like, you know, I stayed local, but I still got further enough away. Mm -hmm. And I can, we I can, the same yeah, thing. I can attest to that because I stayed in Louisiana, but. I knew I wanted to get away from home because there was a University of Louisiana at Lafayette. It was like if maybe to school like, too close yeah, to the it was house, like 30, 30 minutes away from the house. But then I chose to go like uh, uh, two hours away from home. And the reason was like, like you said, I had to make sure that 
I was further enough away from home, but even if something was to go home, I could still drive back. But it changes that mindset because now, like David said, whenever you're too close to home, you don't get that full experience. If you're still living at the mm-hmm. house, you still right. worry about your mom. She might need help with this. And she don't understand that you have these big projects or you're trying to be a part of these clubs and everything. Yes. Still depending on you to do all of this. You got siblings. They need help with all of this. And you can't really fully focus and really get the full college experience right. whenever you're doing it like that. And I have a little sister. She just started her freshman year. And I was trying to okay. tell her, like, please get away. But she didn't. And I'm just she's seeing it now. I'm like, I need you to get away, though. I need you to go to school. She's going to uh, LSU you right now but i was just like you gotta get away so you can really grow and really just spread your wings Mm -hmm. and i just want you to talk to that about how important that is it is it is um because of the exposure and just the the the, and the culture shock you know and it was a big culture shock for me just being in the whole unit i mean i'm talking about like my high school 95 percent african-american and latino to be honest right so that's what i was around that's just the environment you know just around just the i don't say the violence but just like you know it was just like everybody just did the same stuff right just graduated either just chilled out or you graduated and you maybe went to a community college and there's nothing wrong with community college i think that's a great stepping stone if you're taking it seriously and you're also just kind of like you know using it as a, a getting education but a lot of times people just go to community college it'd be like a 13th grade and, it, and I just knew that. And so just staying local, I mean, I have some good friends um, that stay local. They went crazy. Um, our co-founder of, of Brand Resume is Amit Nash. Shout, shout out to Amit. He stayed local and he was able, actually able to take that and, you know, make something of it. But a lot of times when I look back at my network, um, and it's what well, maybe that was like maybe five, six years ago, everybody's still kind of in that same thing. They, they, they just started to figure things out. Whereas like, mm-hmm. I felt like that, that exposure just transcended my entire life because it was just like you just get placed in a, in a location where you got to figure it out new connections new experiences and the next thing you know you sit in your finance class and okay so you know tell me about you, you did not working with your, with your classmates you find out that that their dad is a vp of J, a jp morgan hello so it's like you just start to learn so much around just um being in that environment and the environment is critical towards growth. And I always say that, you know, you got to make sure that you're surrounding yourself with the right people. Your circle is everything, right? Um, you are who, you know, like like the four closest people to you, right? Five, right? Like you got to look at your circle. And so, yeah, like it was a culture shock and just being up there and being around all these different types of personalities and different people. I mean, I, started, I learned so much about Indian culture. I learned more about white people. <laughs> to be honest, I didn't know a lot about white people before college, to keep it honest. And so it was just like real cool because I started to build just the right relationships and um, relationships is everything, right? And it's like, you don't realize that, but then I look back now and it's like, you know, people that I, I met and the relationships that I built in college, like those are the people who now are at the, all, the, all these bigger companies and they're, they're the people who they took themselves seriously, they're gonna be the, the who's who's of the world. And so you always have that comment, like, you remember back when we were studying in a, in, a, in, a, in a library back in like, you know, and if you could always reach out and that's your network, you know? Mm-hmm. And I feel like when you, you stay localized, you kind of limit your network effect in a sense, because it's like, you just around the people that feels comfortable, but you know, there's a saying that you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable, right? And I think that's when you really start to grow. You step out your comfort zone, you say, you know what, I'm just going to figure it out. And um, it just, it just takes, it, it takes everything to the next level, to be honest. Thanks. Thanks. I like that. So yeah, Brandon, my brother, I, I you, I want to go back to your story some. So you, you're a sophomore in college, you get this internship at PWC and I, you let, you mentioned in there, you had the resume and you also said earlier, you were helping people like with LinkedIn and all this stuff. So I want to know, like, when did like that kind of brand resumes, the idea for it start? Because I seen like you were picking up the skills before you really like went ahead and launched it. Yeah, a lot of times, like, you know, you got to look at, like, what you're really good at. And so because I was part of the clubs, right, it goes back to because I was part of the clubs, because I was just so in the professionalism space, like, one of the biggest things is the resume. And I really got, you know, in tune with what that really looks like when I was, like, you know, trying to prepare for, like, the internships or trying to prepare to kind of just be seen when you're going on these networking events. You best believe I have my resume with me. And so it was dates back to, like, honestly, you know, sophomore going into junior year where, again, I already had the internship experience that was dope. But I was like, I was always a hustler, right? I always was still like an entrepreneur inside. Like I remember back to being like 13, 14 shovel snow for 50, $60 a pop. I remember selling like, you know, just things on the side. So I've always like had a hustle in me. And I always realized that like, okay, um, working for somebody is going to be great because that's, uh, that's cash flow. 
But again, like wealth, we talk about wealth and being rich. And I I think there's a big difference between rich and wealthy, right? Rich is temporary, wealthy is forever. And I wanted to be wealthy. And I realized that the only way to do that is to have ownership. And so as early as 20, 21 years old, even though I had the internship, I was already getting ready to lock in the job. Funny enough, lock in the job after the internship. So that $75,000, they actually sent me that offer a year before I graduated. So I went into my senior year with a job. And so what happened is, although I had the job lined up and all that, I was still hungry. I still was not going to just settle. So I was looking at around the things, different things that I could do because the first business idea, it had flopped. Like it didn't, we raised like $3,000 for it. I was pitching that at business plan competitions on campus. And I went over to, um, I think it was one, con- we went traveled and pitched that stuff, but it had failed. And I was like, you know what? It wasn't really a failure. It was like a learning lesson, but I was like, you know, what? I'm not going to just, even though I had that small failure, I still was just still hungry. And so I said, you know, what could I do? And I realized that the reason that I was so successful and the reason that I was like taking off was because I was able to get in the door. And I looked at it and I was like, well, how did I get in the door? And it was because my resume was so spiffed up. It was so great that when they, when that first recruiter looked at it at that conference, she was like, you know what? I'm gonna give this guy a shot, right? Race, religion, ethnicity, nothing mattered. It's how do you look on paper, Mm -hmm. right? And so I was like, well, if I can help as many people on campus with their resumes and and then make them look good, I know that that'll be able to get people in the door because I just wanted more people to be, you know, come from this non-target school to be successful. So that's when it clicked. I was like, wait, that's a need, Need needs-based business. So I said, all right, cool. I did the research. I was on campus crazy. I literally, since I was a part of fraternities, a part of so many different clubs, I had a network. So I literally, you know, old school days, I literally created a Google form. I have it to this date. It dates like 2017, like March. I went to 20 organizations on campus, hit up the presidents, the, the, v, the VPs, like, yo, can I come to your club? I went to 20 clubs and fraternities. I said, yo, I just need two minutes before the before our meeting starts. I was standing in front of the whole auditorium, 30, 40 people. people I would say, look, who has a smartphone? Everybody would, would I raise their hand. I said, okay, cool. Go to this link. It was a link and it was a survey. So I surveyed over 260 college students and I had five, six questions. I said, do you have a resume? Yes or no? Do you have a LinkedIn profile? Yes or no? Um, do you go to the, to the Career Development Center? Yes or no? And it was, how much would you pay for somebody to work on your resume? 10 to $30, 30 to $60, 60 to $80, and like 100 plus. Uh, would you pay for a LinkedIn profile? Same price, right? And, um, and like one other question, and first name and last name, because you need to know who's who, right? Mm-hmm. And like sophomore, juniors, freshman, you know, gotta get you, gotta get you uh, data in line. And so survey set up, I looked at all the numbers, right? That like, of people would pay anywhere between $40 to $80 for someone to write their resume. And I was like, okay, so maybe we onto something here. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I took that data back. Um, I was already studying finance and business. And I was like, okay, cool. So if I'm going to open a business, I need a name. So I came up with resumes.co. It was the first iteration of brand resumes on campus, right? So resumes.co is going to be the name. Um, I was like, so then I need a website. So I literally remember locking myself in in my dorm room for like two months straight went to this website called w3schools.com and it still exists today. It was a repository of coding resources and I learned how to code. So then I built my own website. I was like, I didn't know nobody. I built my own thing, learned JavaScript, CSS, HTML5, learned how to build my own website. So now I had a website, created my own product names, like the the student deluxe package, the the resume supreme package, because you want to give people options in business, right? Not too many. And then I just put them all together, got went on Canva.com. I was, I was, man, stuff people talk about today. I was on it in 2016, 2017. Went to Canva, created a few graphics, and boom. Next thing I knew, I had like a functioning website with the PayPal working. And I started to just market it on campus. So I went around saying, like, look, I can write your resume for $60. You know, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it up. And I had like eight customers. And the crazy thing is that I launched this two months before I graduated. I was mm. still that hungry. I had the $75,000 job waiting for me, but I was still hungry. I still wanted to just try it out. So we, we may have made about $600 in total um, with resumes.co because by the end of it, it was like, well, I had a choice to make. By May, I was graduating. So do I $75,000 job or $600 that I made on the side hustle? What, what are we going to do? So I ended up putting you know, uh, resumes.co in the back burner because although it was a great idea, and I knew that there was a, I was doing all the research. I, did the, I had a spreadsheet, competitive analysis. I was Googling every single resume writing company, every single career coaching company. And I still have it to this day, a spreadsheet. It was like different columns. It was like website. It was like how many employees. It was like um, price points. What was the differentiating factor with them? It was how, how, how good that I felt that their marketing was. I was Real doing market research. research. 
re real research. I'm telling you, like 20 companies. And um, I was and I figured out how it was gonna be different. So our thing was that it was gonna be like on demand and it was gonna be faster turnaround times because people turn around times like two weeks at a time. I was like, now nah, I'm gonna do it faster. So two to three business days, I was gonna try to compete on price. It's gonna be $60, who don't got $60? But we just had hurdles getting it out there because I was just like, I was just thinking like, I'm gonna sell this as many college students as I could. Why? Because that's the environment that I was already in. I was just in the college environment. So mm -hmm. I didn't even think of anything past just that. And it didn't take off. And I was like, damn, man, but you know what? I at least got this internship I, and then I got the job. So I'm gonna go make 75,000. It wasn't too bad. So long story short, I ended up working at PwC as a technology consulting associate, $75,000 in Manhattan. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, I had the gold card, traveling around, flying around as a, as a consultant. For those of you who don't know, PwC is one of the biggest, one of the big four counting firms, um, billions of dollars in revenue. They audit um, and advise some of the largest companies in the world and literally in the globe. They have over 100,000 employees globally. And so as a technology consultant, what my job was to do was to go into different companies and assess them on their uh, technology strategy, right? How are you building your tools? What's inefficient? What can be fixed? What can we automate and, and optimize and streamline? And then manage that project from start to end. And the cool thing about consulting is that you might come in like mid project, you might come in towards the end of the project or you might be in the beginning of the project phase. And so I did that. I crushed it. I excelled at it. I got next thing you know, 86,000, next thing you know, $100,000. And so before I knew it, I was two and a half years in at, at PwC and um, making $100,000, super young, you know, had the craziest network. I was loving it. But at the end of the day, I still wasn't fulfilled with the work that I was doing. I mean, I was building literally building technology systems for financial advisors. I was, in, I was in the financial services space. So I was at, you know, big, the biggest banks on Wall Street, worked at almost all of them. I was in, I was everywhere as young, you know, just sometimes being the only black person in the room of three, four, five hundred people on the floor. And it was just a crazy mental experience, but two and a half years in killing it in the corporate world, I still wasn't fulfilled, even making a hundred thousand dollars super young. And I said, you know what? I still, I'm gonna try and do something else. I'm gonna try and like to shoot my shot because I was always a hustler, always an entrepreneur. I said, you know what? Let me go back to that idea that I had when I was in college of this resume writing company because now two and a half years later, I'm armed with all this corporate knowledge. I'm mm -hmm. armed with, I mean, I was the, the associate on the team, you know, doing the invoicing for some of my projects. I'm cutting $130,000 checks for us billing clients for a team of three, four people per month. So I'm seeing big numbers. Numbers don't scare me at this point. So I'm like, okay, cool. Let me take all this corporate knowledge that I have, bring it back down to a startup level. And what I did is I rebranded. So it wasn't called resumes.com anymore. It's called brand resumes. Um, and I was also going to target a different market. It wasn't just going to be for like sophomores and juniors. I was going to target mid-level mid professionals, executives. And I was also going to target entry-level graduates. And next thing I knew, I figured out where we we're going to be able to make money from this. I went to Upwork. I found a little developer because I realized that the, one of the biggest challenges with the website was good before, but it wasn't great. So I ended up going on Upwork. I found a developer and then he kind of subcontracted and put me to another developer, which ended up becoming our CTO today. Crazy story. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, for $600, I built, I, he, we, we powered through, built the website all while I was still working at PwC, collecting my checks, doing my thing on the side, building up my little empire. Right. So got the website, rebranded it, put like the price point. Now nah, I'm not doing $60 resume no more. We're doing $150 because there's something called perceived value and perceived value is the value in which people are going to perceive it. And typically the higher price goods, people think that it's worth more. It's actually worth the money. It's a, it's a psychology play. Mm -hmm. So pricing strategies is very important in business. Right. And so I increased the prices to increase the perceived value of the services. And I figured out ways in which I could differentiate myself again, literally same concept as before. Relaunched it May of 2019 with our co-founder Ahmed Nath, who I, I tapped, you know, one of my high school, you know, best friends. Like, yo, we're gonna do this thing. And he was working on Wall Street as a sustainability analyst, and he got his master's. Like, yo, Ahmed, I I know we about to, I know we we're on a separate paths, but I really think there's something here. So he ended up quitting his his job, and I still had I was still working at the time. We launched it May of 2019, and it took off like wildfire, hockey stick growth. First month, four thousand dollars in sales. Second month, ten thousand. Third month. $15,162. I remember to this day, the month, the amount of money we made that first three months. And then it was like fourth month, we had $25,000 a month. And we were still working. I was still working full time. Mm -hmm. So that's the story of how Brand Resume started. And it was crazy because it was really just leveraging everything that I knew, mm -hmm. but the different market, because I realized that 
mid-career professionals, which is you've been in your job anywhere from five to 10 years, you know, you're already past like the, you, you're in the resume space, you know how to update your stuff. So these people, you know, maybe making $80,000, $90,000, they'll pay $150, $200. And the mm -hmm. crazy thing is we started at 150 and we realized that people were just buying it like hotcakes. She was like, you know what? Let's raise the prices. In two months, it was 199. People were still buying it like hotcakes. Another two months, we raised prices again, 299. People were still buying it like hotcakes because a needs-based business means that people will need it. And if they don't want to put that time and that effort, they will pay for someone to do it. And when you brand yourself as an expert and you find a niche, because I also said, let's focus on a few industries. We're going to be in financial services, technology, legal, education, HR, right? And it was cool because now you put it in a box to where when people come to your business, if they can fit in a box, meaning that, okay, I'm an entry level graduate and I'm a technology guy. Okay, this package is for me. I'm a, a, a I'm an attorney and I'm an executive. Okay, here's the executive package. That's for me. And so psych psychologically, we put people in boxes and they would come to the website. They can identify with a product without no talking mm -hmm. and purchasing it. And that's essentially how it got started. And it was just, it was just like wildfire. Our calendar would be booked 60, 70, 80 meetings a week. And what we do is 15 minute consultation. So you get on a 15 minute console and you talk your stuff. Okay. Who are you? You talk about, you know, where you're looking to go. I'm thinking about my packages and the process. And in that 15 minutes and most times 10 minutes, $800, $400. And people are just buying because they need it. Right. Mm -hmm. They don't want to spend the time working on themselves. They don't want to spend the time having to, you know, find the old resume. And then like, it's like, you're an expert in this. You know, my terminology. All right. I'm gonna rock with you. And um, man, it's, 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 it's just been crazy. And it was just, um, it got to the point where six months in, we launched it in May of 20 of, uh, of May of 2019 by October, I quit my job. We was grossing $30,000 and I'm only making $4,000 after taxes as a hundred K on the salary. I said, I'm out of here. And I uh, ended up jumping full-time into entrepreneurship, October, I believe 23rd of, um, of uh, 2019. And I never looked back since. And hey, so hey. it was crazy because it was that small idea when I was in college and I couldn't even get people to buy a $60 resume, but the tenacity and the grit and just knowing that it was always a good idea. It was a billion dollar market. I did my research, I did my homework and I ended up, I just needed to get the corporate or not even corporate. I just need to get the, the real business acumen to just say, okay, now I know what's up. And that's kind of how we got started. And uh, that's kind of what where we've been following that trajectory since. Hey, my brother, I just pressure. Said, that pressure. But that that story in, was a great lesson in entrepreneurship mm -hmm. for anybody, just because like if you couldn't find value in that, like there's no such thing as a failed experience, experience or a failed venture. Like you said, you had that first business. Oh, well, kind of flop. But that first business led you to the second business and the second business. You had the idea. And you had a proof of concept, but it you didn't even had people buy people and it didn't work out the way you thought, but right. you and you worked, you did your thing. And I'm pretty sure while you was working in corporate, you didn't even, you probably weren't even thinking about this no more. Like you weren't thinking about brand in the back of my head no more, it's nah. just, but it's a compounding effect. That's what I want people to understand. Like everybody wants stuff to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. You said it had this hockey stick explosive growth, but it wasn't just because you you just had this idea out of nowhere and like it happened. This is three and four years compounding on each other before it happens. I just need people to understand that because a lot of times right now, especially right in now, today's climate, in today's yes. climate, everybody wants the big win, but they don't understand what goes into the big win. It it took you like four or five years to become an overnight success, like a lot of people say. Like a lot of times they just see us once we're done with our process, but they don't see the work that actually went into the the whole process. They don't see the nights, like you said, those two months where you locked yourself in the room learning how to code. They didn't see where you were actually writing these resumes for these people for that $600. They didn't see none of that. But now they see, oh man, that's Brandon Brand resume. He posting his damn screenshots. He getting paid $700 for a resume. He getting paid this. Oh man, I'm gonna go do just what he done. And I, I can be successful, but they don't understand. It takes work. It's, it's going to take time and it's going to take work. You was even making $100,000 a year and you was making 25 bands on the side and you still stuck with that job. And one of the biggest things for me too is that before I even quit my job, 
And that was a crazy thing. And that was a, man, I, no one, man. And people thought I was crazy when I quit my job. They was like, nah, Brandon went off the deep end, right? Now they're looking back like Brandon was a genius, right? Talk about the pandemic and everybody needing resonates. But even before I quit my job, I still was smart enough to understand that that was going to be a big leap. But I decided to, one, make sure that, again, if I was ever going to, if it was still going to fail, right? Being smart now, if it was going to fail, because you never know, business could fail, right? You know, 80% of businesses fail. I ended up getting certified. So I got my PMP certification, which is project manager professional. I got a C CSM certification, certified scrum manager. So then if I ever was going to re-enter the corporate world, I would get paid more than where I left off, right? Let's talk mm -hmm. about it. But what I also did is I made sure that I had money saved up. And I don't really tell, tell people, uh, people this, but I saved my money, right? I wasn't going out, you know, turning up in, in the city all the time. I was stack, stashing my bread, mm -hmm. you know, keeping my expenses low, right? So I ended up saving $50,000. So I had a little nest pool. And then I also decided, like, let me take some money on the side and go buy some real estate. So then I had passive income flowing. So mm -hmm. in the middle of all this, I ended up buying a three-family investment property. So I knew that, look, okay, that was going to net me like $770 a month after everything was paid. So at the, even if it didn't work out, I could jump back into corporate. I had a nest egg and I had passive income coming in, $770. And that's not a lot in bills just in case I fell on my face. Okay. So I want people to know that too. I didn't just quit my job. I strategically planned out how I was going to exit the corporate world. And I executed it flawlessly because and what happened is the real estate kept turning up every first of the month. My favorite time. I just picked up rent today. You know, <laughs> money was coming in. And then secondly, I made sure that the business was sustainable, right? Because we started in May of 2019. A lot of times you can have that fast growth. you like, you're thinking that, oh, it's going to keep going up, right? Uh, GameStop, right? You think it's going to keep going up. But what happens is, what happens is you got to make sure that it's sustainable over time. And so I had six, seven months of watching the sales, you know, grow up and then kind of plateau we're still gonna hit this 25 30 thousand every month month over month i was like all right we got something here because you could you make the mistake and you just jump too quick and then you realize oh man it it didn't really you know what i'm saying and so it was a just real strategic moves that all kind of just worked out that's hey, powerful man. man and i, I kind of want to go into real estate now like where did that idea come from did you learn that while you were in the corporate space did you learn about investing in real estate on, on at the uh, university, or did you have people whenever you're growing up kind of talking about this? Where did you get that idea? Nobody, nobody was talking about real estate, man. I was, uh, I was just, man. So what happened is I was at a sweet 16 for my little cousin, Tasia. And this is, uh, this is back in, um, 2019 as well. Right. And, uh, my older brother, Sean, he's six years older than me. He's, uh, didn't take the corporate path. He works at a uh, national grid, but he gets paid, he gets good money. He's, you know, he does like the oil and gas lines and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So he, he came to me one day and, um, he was like, yo, it was at the sweet 16. He was talking, he was like, yo, like, um, I know you want your business stuff. Cause you know, you da, da, da. But he was like, yo, I got this, I got this idea. Like people from my job, they all own real estate. Right. And these people, no college degree was making $200,000 at national grid, no cap. And just, you know, again, skilled labor and trades. Right. And so he was like, yo, Brandon, like we should jump on this real estate. We're talking about New Jersey real estate, Newark. He was like, yo, like my, one of my men just bought a four family for like 200,000. Look, pulled up the Trulia app while we sitting there, you know, sipping at Sweet 16. And I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever, whatever. You, you know, you just, you just talking whatever. Cause I was just trying to downplay him cause he wasn't in the business space like me. Mm -hmm. And although he's older than me, I was like, man, Sean, Sean don't know what he's talking about. But then, you know, I was like, so then he hit me again, like a month later. I was like, yo, bro, like I'm telling you, the real estate's going up in Jersey. If you got some money on the side, I know you're in the corporate world. Let's, let's get on a deal. And I was like, all right, let me just see what this guy got to say. I started doing the research, Zillow, Trulia. And I was like, oh, wait, okay. Um, three, four families, like 250. So, okay, four doors, three doors. So then I started hitting the podcast game. Shout out to y'all, man. The podcast is crazy. Bigger Pockets podcast. I dove into every episode that I could and they talk about real estate mostly. And I remember just deep listen episodes on like multifamilies, listening to episodes on um, house hacking and those different topics. And I don't know what it was, even in the corporate world, I didn't even know what the hell house hacking was. And so I, I started to realize and learn all these topics. And I was like, yo, and that's when I heard about the FHA. And I was like, oh, so you telling me that we just need three and a half percent? We're going to get a crib? Oh, it's lit. After that, I mean, I said, Sean, how much we need. We Then we went on Zillow. We got a realtor because they connected with realtors and stuff. We started going out there. And then our weekends became, yo, we're going to be looking for a house now because I had the salary. And that's why I always say you got to take your, yourself seriously because, again, you need the salary to prove the income limits, right? Your debt to income, you need to make sure that your income is high, your debt is low. So I always keep my debt low. 
And so I pulled out some money from my, from my 401k because you could actually use money from your 401k to buy your first home. Key fact, right? And so I pulled out money from my, my 401k. I had a little bit of a nest egg on the side. Sean had some cash. So we, I think we invested 19,000 was three and a half percent. We bought our, we bought our first property in Jersey, Newark in a growing area called Week Whack um, for $375,000. And um, it was going to cash flow, uh, you know, overall like 5,300 a month. And we was going to net like 1,900 and then put 250 in a repair fund, split 700 or 770 each. And we just did it, jumped in. We had no experience. But what we also did is we, we, we bought a turnkey property. And mm. so with the turnkey joint, we didn't have to do any rehabs. We didn't have to do any fixing. It mm. was done up. So all we had to do was just, we got the keys. It was beautiful. I mean, it was like the, like one of the nice houses on the block. And I think the previous owner brought it as a foreclosure, put the 100000 in there, and then he flipped it to us. But we didn't want to do too much. Sean worked full-time. I worked full-time. I had the business on the side. So we ended up buying this. Um, turnkey got three tenants. One, one, um, one tenant was Section 8. Two was... Uh, just regular tenants, all black families. And I, I was really critical on that, right? Because it was a beautiful place. And it's been over two years. They've never not paid rent on time. Even the Section 8 tenant, it's been excellent. That money's coming in from the government. And on top of that, um, it's just, just it's just been great. And so that real estate play kind of came out of nowhere. But then it's just realized that, you know, there's an, an opportunity. And the, and the crazy thing about it is I kind of slacked. And I should have took Sean serious a little bit earlier because it took us like five, six months to close the deal. And in that time, man, the real estate went up crazy. So when we we got like the tail end of the three, four family, you can't even get a three, four family for that price in Jersey at this point. And I think the house is worth about five hundred thousand dollars now, a year and a half That's later. Insane. I gotta give you the clap, bro. Hey, real talk. Hey, my brother, I also want you to walk it back because you mentioned the borrowing from the 401k plan. People really don't know about that as an option. Can you talk about that a little bit more, like how that process played out for you? Yeah, absolutely. So, Trip. So, because I was working in the corporate, right? You get they was matching my my um, 401k contributions, and so um, you could you could invest in 401k pre tax and um and um and post tax. So I think I was doing like pre tax or something like that. So it was before that they was taxing it. So it was going to be building up a little bit higher cash value a little bit earlier. And I think the idea behind it is that when you then retire, you'll pay the taxes, but or something like that. Whatever the case yeah. may be. But I did know that they was matching it. So it was good. It was, I was putting in, they was putting a little, you know, 25% match or whatever. And over a year or so, I had like eight, nine, 10 bands in my 401k. And traditionally your parents say, oh, don't touch your 401k, blah, blah, blah. But that's like, if you want to go take it out and go do something stupid with it. But I knew I was going to go take this money and put it into an asset, right? And so you can actually pull from your 401k with no penalty if you're using that money for, for your first home. A lot of people don't know about that. And mm -hmm. I didn't even know about that. That's how I do my research. And so I pulled that money out and it was like a justification box. Like, why are you pulling your money out? Because if not, oh, you get taxed crazy. Like 20% at the time. Yeah, and, then, penalties and, and, all come, and then come tax season, you also get taxed again. And so I didn't get taxed on that on that money because it was going straight into my first home because I was still young. It was my first home. It doesn't matter if it was an investment property or not. And so it was. I was able to leverage that capital because I didn't have too much in my bank account. But I had a decent little bit in my 401k because I was just putting money every paycheck period, like $370 in my 401k every single paycheck. It don't sound like a lot, but then that's $700 a month over a year, year and a half. You got you got some, and then they're matching it. You got some money in your 401k. Mm -hmm. And so you could actually tap that to um, do certain things. I think like funerals or like, um, or like real estate, like they, they, they'll either, um, it's like tax deferred or you don't get taxed for it at all. And so we got, I, I benefited from that. It was super smooth. I just went, I said, YOLO. Cause I went broke buying that for his house. I'm not gonna lie. Cause I took that 401k money and I had a little bit extra I needed. And I just, I mean, I went broke buying that first. So I had no money in my account. That's like, I was like, Sean, this, this better be worth it. But it was good. <laughs> I mean, after we, we, we bought the house, we only needed to buy a mailbox, to store security cameras. And that was it. That was like, that was, that was it. And I, man, I remember I, I went on, um, I went on Trulia. I created a little listing and I did something crazy too. So as we were buying the house, I don't know if it's legal or not, but as we were buying the house, when we was getting ready to close, what I did is you got the inspection thing. So when we had the inspection, I was kind of there. And so I was taking pictures of the unit right before we closed. So I had some nice photos. So mm -hmm. I went on Trulia before we closed and put up the listing for the apartment rental. So by the time that we closed on the house in, um, in a week, we did an open house. And I already had like a bunch of people who was interested and we put tenants in in two weeks from the time that we closed. Mm. We didn't even, it was like smooth. Okay, Whole so it was filled. 
whole unit was filled two weeks after we closed. Now, I, I think that was crazy. Because sometimes That's it takes forever awesome. to find the tenants. But I kind of like, I was like, you know, I got these photos. Let me go and chill. I put the little listings, 1900 you know, 1700 and then 1400 for the two bedroom one. Because it's, it's, it's nine bedrooms, three baths, uh, three family. And uh, yeah, so it was just, and it was just like, boom, just now we own a real estate. It was it was that easy. So um, yeah, that that's what really helped me because, you know, when I quit the job, I had the real estate coming in. It's a small check, but it's something, you know, and then I had the little nest egg. And so, yeah, the real estate game is crazy. And I'm still looking to buy more real estate when the time comes, but I'm, I'm, I'm calm right now because I mean, I got, I got one, it's cash flow positive. My tenants are amazing. And so it's just a little something every first of the month. Hey. Hey, I love man, it. I, I appreciate love it you too. sharing that, my brother. Cause like, yeah, we wouldn't have known that you you'd done that play. But once again, helping people understand that it's more to it than just what you hear. Like you you gonna it, you gotta you're not just gonna jump off the porch. You gotta have strategy with this shit. You can't just be out there like, hey man, fuck it. I'm just gonna do what I'm gonna do. Cause I feel <laughs> like that was a regret of mine, man. Like yeah, me I too, had a, man. I had an fu fund. Like I had savings and shit. But whenever you don't have all oh. these other contingencies mm -hmm. laid out you going you going to be out there looking trying to figure it out for a minute man playing like, off your back foot instead of you actually having the plan and you being proactive instead of reactive thanks but brandon my brother i want to hop into the resume just a tad bit more um with you so i had one question for you earlier like what do you think is the biggest mistake people make when writing resumes mm. man so let's just talk about it so when it comes to the resume game and it's a Man, billion dollar business writing these resumes, helping people with the professional branding and coaching. Because, like I said, when, when people you know need need a resume, a lot of times they don't know what they're doing. And we talk about some of the biggest mistakes. Um, first things first is people still have these objective statements on a resume, and I don't know where they came from, but the objective gotta go right. People know recruiters have under time it is they know what your objective is by you even applying. So we can replace the objective statement with a professional summary. Right. That's one of the first things. Professional summary, three, four sentences, high level, years of experience and two are key things that really differentiate yourself uh, from everybody else. Right. And then secondly, a lot of times people are missing sections on their resume. So every resume needs a skill section, hard skills, right? Software programs, technologies and tools. So if you don't have skills, because what happens is there's a concept called ATS. And the ATS is an applicant tracking system. It's the software that all the recruiters and high managers use to sift through the resumes, dozens, hundreds of resumes that get submitted for a job. On average, 250 um, resumes per open job per, 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 uh, per a job opening. And so what happens is, you know, these recruiters are trying to parse through the resume and keywords and searching and filtering. And so if you don't have the right keywords in and, and today's day and age, skills on the resume, you're going to get passed over because again, if candidate A doesn't have the right skill sets, but then candidate B does, I'm calling candidate B all day, every day, right? And so a lot of times people are missing the right, the, 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 the right sections. Um, they might have, and then also, let's talk about it, how you order the sections. Because again, you know, it, depending on where you're at from a career perspective, if you're, if you're an executive, for example, let's say you're a VP of marketing at Nike, right? You know, the college experience that you had about 13, 15 years ago is not the most relevant to have at the top of your resume. The first third of a resume is what people actually look at. And in that eight to 10 second glance, if they don't figure out that in that first little, you know, re review, if you, if this even worth pursuing, they're not even going to look at it more. We're going straight to the note pile. And that's even if you made it to someone actually looking at it. Okay. Cause these scanning systems, these parsing technologies, they're real sophisticated and you go straight to the note pile. And so a lot of times how you order in terms of relevancy, the section so that you the, the most important information is on the first third of the resume of the first page. That's what's super critical. And people don't know that. So they'll have all the, the, the garbage information at the top. And if so, if I look at that and I, and I don't, if I don't get any um, indication of that you're a good candidate from that first glance, I'm not wasting no time. I have a lot of recruiters in my network. I talk to them every single day. I know what they're looking for. And so that's one of the biggest things is how we're ordering the, the resume in terms of relevance, the relevancy factor. And then to top it off is the bullet points. And so a lot of times people have, man, if you got a resume, open up your resume right now because you might have that four or five word bullet point and that's not it. It's not enough information to contextualize what you've done. The mm -hmm. reason that resumes and we write five star resumes is because it has the uh, contextual impact built in. Right. So it's not about what you did. Right. It's about what did you do to do that? And then what was the impact? So there's an X, Y, Z formula that we use in terms of writing these resumes that work. It's not just I'm going to write a resume. It's like we have a whole methodology and how we go about doing this. And it's very successful. 
So it's all about the accomplishments. It's about the achievements. It's about the impacts and the success stories. That's what people care about. Not just that you launched a podcast, but did you launch a podcast with over 300,000, you know, monthly users that then increased, you know, uh, brand awareness by X percent? That's what people care about, right? And so that's the impact that people don't really get and they'll just put their duties, but we need to move away from duties to more accomplishments and success stories. Mm. Mm. And I, I got another question. I heard you say, you know, on the first page, a lot of times people think that I just need a one page resume. Yeah. Is that still the standard in today's industry or is it okay for you to have a two page resume? So one page is definitely the standard, but it definitely does depend based off of where you're at from a, a seniority perspective. Okay. So if you're at entry level, hands down, you need a one page resume. Even if you're a mid-career professional, so you might have like three to like, you know, 12 years of experience, you can be able to condense that. And condensing into the one page is good because it, it shows the, the folks that you're able to synthesize information and put what's critical, right? Because not everything is critical. Let's be honest. When you get a job, you got that job description. I got like eight, nine bullet points of what you're going to do. When you get into that job, you're going to do a hundred different things. Let's be honest. But it's about what's relevant and what's going to definitely move the needle as it relates to what you, to what they're hiring for. Okay. So a lot of times, you know, people don't realize that. And so one page is definitely the standard in a sense, but if you're an executive that has 15, 20, 30 years of experience, we might need, need to do a two page because of the, the breadth of experience to where we might need to capture certain things. And you just got a lot to talk about. You might, we might have core competencies, professional summary, right? And have other things on there. Your technical skills might be across different systems, different programs, right? And so sometimes it, it is critical for a two pager, but never more than a two page resume at all. There's no ifs, ands, buts about it. And no funky colors, no funky fonts. You know, people put like this random weird stuff on a resume. I've seen resumes like pink words and like, I mean, I even saw I even saw a resume with a dog on it. So I mean, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna work. And so that's just just some 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 of the quick things that um people don't really realize. And it doesn't matter if you're the entry level graduate or you're the VP executive, the the, the VP at TD Bank, seven years of experience. I talk to these people on a daily basis. I talk to CEOs. I talk to the chief chief of staffs. Nobody understands how this stuff works. You'd be surprised. Wow, I can imagine, bro. Like most people, when it comes to writing a resume, they're going on word or they going on whatever whatever document processor they got they're going to click on a little template and they're going to just change the information would That's you it. just you just say it was a whole mouthful like the idea the objective statement i always thought that was the dumbest shit in the world like it is why why, why are you applying to this job because i want a job <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> what are we here for <laughs> That's hilarious, man. No, nah, real talk, though. But and I, I got another question pertaining to the resume structure. Like, is it okay to put a, a picture of yourself on your resume? I see some people doing that nowadays too. Absolutely not. Now, there's two. Now, there's there's two concepts. One, um, there's something called um, like the like the traditional resume, right? From a, from a, from a, a traditional resume perspective, you don't want any photos because also those don't parse well with. Remember, or I said there's an ATS system. The mm -hmm. pictures don't parse well in the, in the ATS. Pictures, text boxes, um, certain shapes and icons, it doesn't jive well. So then if you do have that stuff, where well, your professional experience is, it's going to have like an education. It's going to be all jumbled up. And when they get it on their end, they're going to say, nope, straight, straight, straight to the no pile, right? So you mm -hmm. don't want that. Now, you got these kind of like graphically designed, real nice and sexy resumes that you see. And it's like, oh, I look pretty popping. But the thing is like, that's nice if you have the warm connection with the recruiter and hiring and headhunter, and you're just going to email that across. So it's not going through any automated system. Okay. But if you're going to put your resume through any automated system, i.e. applying online or applying on like a LinkedIn or something like that, where it says upload your resume, you want an ATS optimized resume and you do not want your photo on it whatsoever. That's why you have a LinkedIn. From a LinkedIn perspective, you got your photo on there, you have a headliner, you got summary again and a whole bunch of different stuff. And so what we do is we put LinkedIn profiles on your resume in terms of the link, key fact, a lot of people don't even do that still. And so they can easily click access your LinkedIn, see your beautiful face, preferably smile with a nice background and nice suited up, look real good. And then they'll be able to deep dive into your professional experience. And one more thing just with it, the uh, cover page. Uh, is that critical, like having that cover page uh, attached to the resume? Like our Cover letters, man. I mean, with the amount of applications due to the pandemic and just the amount of people who unfortunately were furloughed or laid off or couldn't or just looking for a new job. 
I mean, there's so many resumes floating around that these recruiters don't have time to get to the cover letter. I'm going to be quite honest, right? It's like one of those, almost like a thing in the past where mm -hmm. it's cool if you put it together and you submit it with it. I mean, you could might get a brownie point. You might, but nine times out of 10, they're not even getting to the cover letter. It's like, yo, is your resume solid or not? Because I got a thousand candidates to go through and read shortlisting the resumes and that's what we're going to do. So not say that they don't look at it, but it's not as um, high up on the totem pole as like a really nice resume or a really nice LinkedIn profile. That's what's super critical in today's day and age. And, you know, again, it's just the professional branding, right? Like you get the photo on the LinkedIn and the nice summary, you can put your little header too, you can customize your header. So that's what's critical, right? Nice LinkedIn profile, you need a LinkedIn profile because mm -hmm. it's your digital uh, version of yourself. It's, it's your digital um, business card at this point, And you need a nice resume to go along with that. Um, and those two things is what really gets people in the door and then gets them hired. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you for breaking that down, yes, my indeed. brother. Yeah, you got me thinking about LinkedIn. I got to go revamp mine, man. I, yeah, you know, it's definitely an underutilized tool. Like, it's crazy because, like, I realized the power of LinkedIn during the pandemic. During the pandemic, like, we were like, man, we was trying to do a little laptop drive. We was trying to raise some money, get some laptops together. And we were like, man, how are we going to get these laptops? They're not selling them to nobody. Go to LinkedIn. You get access. You pay, what, like, 30, 40 bucks. You can start sending messages to people who like our VPs of companies. I just started, I started shooting messages to everybody. Like Best Buy hit me back. He put me down, pushed me down the ladder and we got our stuff rolling. Like LinkedIn is a powerful tool. So I kind of want to ask like even more, like just to, to dive a little bit deeper. What do you think are like the key things people need to have on a LinkedIn account? Oh man, LinkedIn is crazy. And I think that to answer that question, it's, it's pretty cool and pretty sub, sub, subjective in a sense because People use LinkedIn for different things. So LinkedIn is the largest professional network on the internet, over 330 million monthly active users, and it's growing. And essentially, people go on LinkedIn for networking, right? And so if you don't know how to network, it's a great place because if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, what it is, it's like a Facebook-style feed of companies that you can follow, and they'll put out information. People who you follow who put updates on like what they do or when, when they got a new job or there's different things, and they're sharing good information on a specific niche or topic or industry. And so if you don't know about a lot of companies, you can follow companies, same way that you kind of, you know, be on uh, Instagram, but you're getting a lot of good knowledge and good information, right? So it's like a real healthy, real kind of professional social network. So that's for anybody who doesn't know what LinkedIn is, because you've got a lot of people out there who still don't know what LinkedIn is, right? Now, when you get onto LinkedIn, you might have a really basic account, which you might not have a photo. So you can, you need a beautiful photo that's hands down, preferably smiling, right? And I'll dump into what you right? but everybody has different, you know, focus points of why they're using LinkedIn, right? You could be using LinkedIn because one, you're looking for a job. And then, so from a job seeking perspective, you need to have a, a really nice headline. So what happens is the same way that people can search a resume in like an ATS, you, people can search for you on LinkedIn and they can search based off of your headline. So you might, you really do need your job title that you want in your headline and one or two other things like what type of professional, are you an education professional? Are you a finance professional? So that's headline, headline needs to be solid. You need a great summary. And a lot of times people don't know how to put together summaries. It's like, they don't know where to start. They, they'll just start putting like random facts about themselves and their summary is trash. You need a, a great summary. It doesn't need to be a biography. It needs to be about a paragraph and then industries, you know, areas and then how to contact you and a whole bunch of other stuff like that. So we, we kind of put those together. Um, and then you need to have all the right skills, right? Because it, there's a whole skill section where when you're going to apply for a job, if you don't have all the right skill sets that is on your profile that's listed on the job, it'll be like, hey, man, you only have like two out of 10 of the top skills, so you're not a good fit or three out of 10. But you can add those skills on your profile and it's free. It's not like you got to pay nothing, but people don't know that. So they got they don't have the right skills on their profile. You could put your education there. You can um, put any certifications that you have. And even this is another key thing. Even if you haven't got the, gotten the certification yet, you can put like in progress. Mm -hmm. So it shows people that look like. I'm pursuing this. So it's like, okay, this guy's already on his stuff or this girl's already like on, um, on her on grind. And then you can um, also put like open to work now. So you let people know that you're open to pursuing opportunities. And then there's all these like back end settings that aren't even front facing that you can trigger on the back end of LinkedIn in the settings. It's kind of what we do for people to let people know that you're looking for a job even further than that. It'll signal to recruiters, headhunters, hiring managers. And so it gets real nitty gritty on from the LinkedIn side of how you can really optimize that profile, you know, beautiful headline that you can um, um, header image. So there's a lot of different things that you can do to optimize your profile from a job seeking perspective. And you do want to be heading up the recruiters. You do want to be you know, figuring out how you're going to get in. And the key to LinkedIn is you do want to post because 99% of people on LinkedIn don't even post. They just lurkers. Yes. So you want to start to get some um, expertise in your field and just share your opinion. People are so afraid to share their opinion on a topic, right? 
put your opinion out there, right? On this new thing in, in your industry, because you never know, someone might think about that perspective and be like, yo, that's dope. I, and the comment on that and the engagement piece. So you should be engaging in people, especially influencers in your industry. So that's how you get known, that's how you get seen, that's how you network. That's job seeking game on LinkedIn. Now, you might also be using LinkedIn from a business owning perspective, and I use both, right? I'm on LinkedIn and I'm trying to get some business. I, I'm trying to get you know my clients and my money up. So from a from a, a, a consultant or from a business owner perspective, you can have a company page and you every business needs a company page. Hit me up if you don't got one. You need the company, you need a company page that, that has everything on there, employees when you founded, your expertise is um, because it's good for SEO, beautiful for SEO, search engine optimization and how you rank higher in Google. So people Google your company name, boom, first thing is LinkedIn, even sometimes before your website, LinkedIn, boom, company. So you can have a company banner. You can also put like your employees can be attached to that. And so you want to brand your LinkedIn company page around your company, because then if someone ever looks you up or finds you, they see everybody's nice and nice in here. Everybody's connected. And then um, it just pushes your company brand. And so when people are searching for, let's say, like a, a marketing agency, your company might pop up and they might click on that. Say, oh, this is dope. I like I like this stuff. They click into your profile, see your profile, your profile's good. And you can even brand your profile from a business owning perspective to get more leads. So now we're not talking about job seeking content, we're talking about sales copy, right? You know, copy that's going to help people read, you know, your profile and be like, yo, I might want to sponsor this podcast. I might want to get in tune with them and partner with them. So you can write content in a way that's going to then get people to want to give you money and work with you. And so that's where from a business owner perspective, people don't leverage LinkedIn enough. And when people see like VP or directing your title, president, CEO, that means something because it's like, oh, I'm talking directly to the CEO. You could be in your shorts. You ain't never been to never going to bed, but you call yourself CEO. I mean, people going to think you're the CEO. And so you can brand yourself to whatever you want to be. The world's your oyster on LinkedIn. But people need to realize that you can use it from a job seeking perspective, but you can also use a platform to make money. And I make money on LinkedIn every single day. That's one of the biggest lead generators for resume writing businesses because full Everybody. of job seekers. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about it. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, that's just breaking down LinkedIn because there's so much on there that you can do and leverage. There's so many opportunities. And with the in-mail joint and with an in-mail is you can send people like a direct message. Like it's going to get to their inbox. It's called an in-mail. And that's mm -hmm. if you have a premium account on LinkedIn, which is only 30, 40, 50 bucks. And so if you want to hit up like the VP of Coca-Cola that is in diversity and inclusion, you know, shoot your shot. There's many of them. And so it's super cool because you can get real connected with people. You don't want to just spam people or have like a stupid message. Like think it out. You know, really, uh, you know, come with something of value. People, people don't got a lot of time. Same, same thing like the Instagram DMs. People just want to DM you like, I'm interested you in getting a resume done. Well, bro, I got the link tree. I have <laughs> link in my bio. Like, don't hit me up about you're interested because you go to my website. It's already there. So if you're gonna be, if you're gonna hit people up, be very strategic and uh, be cognizant of people's times and you know things that they got going on. But LinkedIn is such a BC tool, man. Um, I'm on LinkedIn all day, every day. Hey, man, I, I thank you so much for breaking that down. And we got to get with you with the yeah. business page because we yeah, had tried, to set, down, we tried to set We tried to set it up, but they shut us down talking about we didn't follow the guidelines or whatever. We did it wrong. Uh, I think we set it up. I'm going to get y'all right. An individual <laughs> account or something. But yeah. Hey. It's all good. Gems. So you talking about LinkedIn. We talking about software. Kind of made me want to pivot into your company. Yeah, you man. Just like, how launched. were you managing, like, your 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 new software as a service mm -hmm. company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it really stemmed from brand resumes and to break it down, like I said, brand resumes, we launched in May of 2019. We're approaching a million dollars in revenue uh, overall in only just under two years. Um, over, you know, 45, you know, resume writers and career coaches globally across four countries. And our internal team has really stemmed out, you know, big shout out to our VP. I couldn't do it without Amit. Uh, this guy's an animal. Amit Nath, follow him. Um, he's killing it in the stock game and is also big on the resumes and stuff. And so when we, where we're at right now is, uh, you know, we realized very early on as we were building it and had the hockey stick growth, we're getting 50, 60, 70 clients a month coming in the door. There were just some inherent challenges in managing resume writing orders, just managing a writing order. And so when, if you're smart enough, right, if you have a challenge, you're going to go to Google, like, how do I fix this or what type of solution? So we were Googling solutions in terms of like, how can we better manage and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, streamline the client communication? Let's say from the time that somebody purchases an order, right? How do I get them my questionnaire? How do I get them a contract? How do I get them a uh, follow-up questions? How do I then deliver the draft so it's not an email? And people lose emails, emails don't, don't hit the, the, the inbox. And so there was all these issues in the business that were just like, okay, how do we solve this stuff? And what happened is I tapped my, uh, our guy who was do, you know, doing all the technology, yo, could we build a platform to kind of help out with this internally? And so what happened is um, we rolled out a platform towards like November, 2019. It was an MVP 
just for brand resumes. And it was a tool where there was like an admin portal, a writer portal, and then a customer portal. So now customers could like create their account and then they can um, go through a whole flow that we built out, a whole workflow, automated email touch points and everything that was going on. So they were connected. There was chat feature built in. So super dope. So we created it back in May of 2019 to solve our own issue because it was just too crazy. Talking about 80 orders a month, doing all email. Oh my God. It was oh, just I know insanity. That's and send, I mean, talking about on average 14 to 20 emails per customer and then just losing them and keeping track of them. You got your Google spreadsheets over here and it was just so crazy to manage. Virtual assistants out the Wahoo trying to keep it all together. And so we built this technology for us internally and it was like night and day. I mean, it's just like client comes in, click assign a writer and the whole process flows streamlined. You don't really worry about nothing. And so what happened is we figured that all out and cracked the code because we already was cracking the code with our business model where people were paying us for resume packages and they got to pay over time um, through Klarna. So that's how people was even jumping into the business and the, the packages was going crazy. So as we were getting all these orders, they were going through this system that we created for ourselves. And it was just like all automated, all streamlined, customers was loving it. It was very easy to manage. And so I was like, man, how many other people in the world who run resume companies or career coaching companies or touch resumes and get paid for it resume reviews, all that, critiques, could use a system to better manage their business. And that's where RightC came to be. So RightC is a first of its kind um, order management slash writing operations platform for digital writers to better manage their business. And so we took the MVP, we upgraded it, built it on all the latest and greatest stuff that like the Facebooks and the Netflix are built on from a technology perspective so that it gets that scale. And what happened is I used to manage technology teams when I was at PwC. So I took my own knowledge again, and um, we invested thirty, forty thousand dollars into building this software. Whereas it might have cost about hundred, uh, would have cost about a million dollars if we would have built this, you know, like corporate and paid somebody to do it. Um, we we built it in five and a half months, which is record speed. Most software products take like a year to, to just be, be built, and um, we launched it with the goal of being able to help now our entire industry better automate, better manage their business with a, a more sophisticated portal for them as a company. Uh, a writer portal, so your contract writers, or just you as a, you're a single writer can then better manage your orders and then a customer portal. And the dope thing about it is white label. And so white label means that like, they'll never know that it's your company running it because it can then be their logo, their color scheme, they can customize it so it's their brand, but your technology sits on, on the infrastructure level and powers the whole thing. And so um, it's almost like how Amazon has all these like little Sprinter trucks delivering packages. Those aren't Amazon trucks. Those are small fleets that they've been wrapping in Amazon branding, mm -hmm. white label concept. And so we white labeled our software. So now anybody can use it who, you know, manages uh, resumes or wants to start doing resume writing business. They don't have to have like the old years long headaches of doing this all through email. It's a technology system where they can just easily get in, set it all up in about a day or two, and then just get running and have this amazing technology suite to better manage their business. And the idea behind it is that sooner than later, not only will we we'll be able to just help, you know, uh, resume based writers, but then grant writers, script writers, copywriters, ghost writers, content writers, blog writers, um, anybody who's doing writing based projects, there's nothing out there in the world that helps them better manage their business. So, uh, kind of like the way that we're doing with, with our workflows and how we built it with all the automation and soon we'll do the machine learning and stuff like that. And so it was really just like finding a problem in our own industry that we knew that was we were facing and then literally putting the, the dogs behind to build some software to fix it. And now we're charging uh, monthly for people to use it. And we launched it uh, December, late December of 2020. Um, we've literally got about seven, eight customers already. We're doing demos. I got a whole team fully focused on selling the right C software. And people are signing on annual contracts, quarterly contracts. They're loving it already. And so the idea is that we're going to raise up, maybe raise some, uh, some, some private investment to build the software and take it to the next level, which we want to do, um, preferably, you know, um, VC or something else, and then uh, just kind of uh, take it to the moon, right? Um, I think we got the early traction, so we know people like it, the, the demos, people love it. And so it's just crazy, like, now we're serving the masses from a technology perspective, because we were already serving the masses, just doing the resumes and doing the orders, but now we're like, how can we help? everybody. So we're democratizing the access to high quality technology. It's where if you just got started off, you're already sophisticated, you can use it. Mm, that's powerful, my brother. I got to connect it with my boy Pedro up there in Delaware too. Oh, he's yeah, in Pedro VC. VC. He's uh, in VC advisor. and he's getting into a uh, private equity too. He, I was actually just talking to him yesterday. So I got to connect y'all, my brother.
For sure, for sure. I definitely appreciate it. Software yeah. goes crazy. And if you look at like software multiples in terms of uh, uh, what software companies sell for, um, it's pretty high. And software is like, it's, it's an amazing business because it's like the cost to running a software company are so low. And that's why software is really what kind of kept the stock market afloat. We talk about stocks and stuff like that. Like the tech sector is booming. It's going crazy. to keep booming, you know, for the next infinity and beyond. And so it does industry you're in whether you you know sell like you do like a nail tech or you do a barber or you you know do home cleaning if you find a, 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 a need for some type of solution to better manage or better solve any problem you know think about building some technology because technology is the future i'm bullish on it um, i was a technology consulting associate so i got to see high level tech projects at both billion dollar companies it's definitely where you want to be um and it's just crazy that now we're able to then have our own software. So it's running two companies, Right C and Brand Resumes, but they both conjoined because Brand Resumes uses Right C as well. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, pretty crazy. Hey, man, I love it because it's another business lesson in it too. Hell yeah. Vertical integration. We've talked about it many times. People, people always wonder like, well, how do I do that? Well, you did it like this. I had a problem. I solved it for myself. And then I seen, well, shit, if I got the problem, other people got the same problem and I'm gonna provide the solution. One thing I love about the uh, the whole software as a service space is that it's really B two B heavy. Can you kind of talk about that, like how that how that plays a role revenue wise for it? For sure, B two B is 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 an animal. That's why Microsoft is where they are today. They're pretty much they were pretty much all B two B in their in their early days, selling uh, software systems and operating systems stuff like that to to, to to businesses. And so when it comes to the B two B market, business to business, you're essentially going after other businesses and saying, hey. I have a solution for you that you can use and you can pay me monthly for it. And you have access to using it for your business to help whatever specific situation. And so you think about a company like Salesforce, where they're B2B software, they're, they're selling a CRM, customer right. relationship management tool, where, you know, you can then um, better manage your contacts, right? So you're a business owner, you um, are the, you, you run like a, I don't know, a resurrecting business, for example, you want to keep track of all of your customers, all of your whatever, whatever, whatever or you know, what have you, or you're Nike, you want to keep track of all your people. How do you do that? How does your sales team better manage their business? So Salesforce went crazy and they're just selling software to people because people need it. You don't need, there's no upfront, you know, crazy investment. You just go on salesforce.com, get in, pay it, and boom, you already have access to it. So you don't have to wait. And so from a B2B perspective, selling to companies, it's a different ball game. And it was a pretty interesting business lesson for us and for me in general, because being on the B2C side, selling resume services and career coaching packages to individuals who really need to get, make more money, um, essentially, you know, just improve their financial situation. That's like, I'm just getting on a consultation with, you know, uh, with Joe and Joe here likes what I got to say. He's buying a package. We're going to help him. But a business, the business is like, okay, I might have to find a decision maker or key stakeholders. Like, okay, well, you know, yeah, this might, I might want to talk to the CEO, but I also need to talk to the COO or the operations manager. And so it's a different level and a different game because you, you need to get more people involved in the conversation to make a deal close. Mm -hmm. And most times you have like yearly contracts and stuff like that. But the thing about software and B2B selling is that it's a concept called stickiness and you want to have sticky technology. Sticky means that like if someone uses our system and our platform, it's freaking phenomenal, right? But it's like, it's almost really hard to stop using it because it's like, all your customers are going to be there, all your orders, all your data. So then moving to another system is like, that's like, man, I don't want to do all that. And so that's how you kind of get, get people on the recurring billing and they don't never stop using your software. But then also you need amazing customer service. You need, you know, amazing whatever. So you lower your churn rate. Churn rate is like the turnover in your customers. It's like a VC concept. So it's like, you want to make sure that people are continuously using your, your software. You're providing excellent service. And then you just scale into infinity and beyond. And so that's why software companies like the Airbnbs and the right about like that's why they're, they're going crazy because it's like it's low cost to run them from a data storage perspective. And it's really just like payroll and personnel. And if your customer service is great and your product is great, people are gonna love it. They're gonna tell somebody else and it's gonna keep growing organically. And all you gotta do is just market and get it out there, right? Put on put, get some Facebook ads going, um, you know, or go directly to the people, go on LinkedIn, find out that's what we do. We go on LinkedIn. We do a search, resume writer. We find all the resume writers. We hand them all up. Yup, we got we got a software for you. Come check this out. Hop on the demo, and you do the demo hour. You impress them. You tell them what's up. You spit your game, and look, you gonna make the decision or not. And so, if you really got good stuff, people are gonna really resonate with it. And the sexy part about it is that we built a software for our industry when we were already 
you know, killing the industry. So we knew we knew all the inherent challenges. What you don't want to do, you don't want to build something that you don't know people are really going to buy it or, or want it. And so back to even when I was doing that market research for the for resumes.co, right? You need to do your research because you need to understand if there's really a market. You need to understand that people are really going to buy this. So before you invest a dime in anything, go do your research, please. Go talk to your ideal customers. Go really see if they are going to want this. You don't honestly, you have to sell them the dream and tell them that you're going to do some, you know, next level stuff. But like, hey, is this something that you might pay for? Or is something that is really something that, you know, is there? And I feel like a lot of times in entrepreneurship, I'll just say this, people don't do their research and that's why they fail. But if you just meet, um, execution with the right pre uh, preparedness, you're really going to definitely thrive and grow, right? Because again, you did your research. So you you took a calculated risk. You didn't just jump off the deep end and say, I'm going to just do this. And so I don't live my life by chance. I definitely am very strategic in everything that I do, uh, where, I, where I place my time because running, you know, the real estate and the and the, and the software and the trucking and everything, like you got to be able to prioritize and be able to, need to focus. And so um, everything that you do should be strategic. Mm. All 2021. That's it. And I love how you, you know, you went from the B to C and the B to B. And I know you also recently released a new, another product where you're actually teaching people how to start writing resume, resumes. So can we kind of start, can we kind of get into that and explain, explain about that so our people can know what's going on? Yeah, for sure. And so, you know, because I really, you know, man, I've been through it in this industry, you know, five, six years, been in, being in this business, I've already mastered the game in a sense where I understand what it takes to start off or come in um, with a little experience already and be able to thrive. And so a lot of times when it comes to the resume writing business, people realize that this is such a big industry, such a big market. It's over $50 billion in this career advancement resume writing space. So it's a lot of more you know, top resumes and all that to be, to be out here and doing the thing. And so what I decided to do is put all my information, my guidance, my expertise, the failures that I had, the, oh man, this ain't going to work and put it into a, essentially a course where now I'm able to teach, look, you got an interest in entrepreneurship. You might be good at writing. You might be in the HR field, or you might just think that this is a great business to jump into from a profit margin perspective. It's crazy because there's no upfront investment rather than what Wi-Fi, computer and um, some hustle. <laughs> and you can jump in because again, there's no barriers of entry or big barriers to jump in and create your own resurrecting company. You could create your own career coaching company, right? And so what I'm essentially doing is teaching people who want to make anywhere, I would say like, $1,500 to $4,000 per month on a minimum, just getting started into this business so that, hey, this is what you need to do. This is what an amazing resume looks like. This is what an executive, a federal, military transition. This is what a CV should look like. So we train people now on the art of five-star resume writing because you want five-star reviews when you start running your stuff, training on the ATS systems that I spoke about, training on essentially how to get the sales in the door, how to manage the client interactions so that you can then start your own resume writing business if you think it's a great idea or scale up and maximize the one that, that, that you already have. Because one of the biggest things that I found out is people don't know how to make money. And um, that's not just resume writing. That's a lot of different businesses. You might know how to do the thing, but if you don't know how to get leads in, right? Lead generation, you don't know how to do the sales piece of it or get in a call and do a, and execute a, a successful 10, 15 minute consultation, you won't make the money. And so I've figured it all out. I understand all the different lead angles. There's marketplace platforms. You can subcontract. There's career fairs all the time. So I'm essentially teaching people how to jump in this space and make money as a resume writer. And to be honest, because of the software and the technology, it's so simple where you don't even need to be the one writing the resume. You just mm -hmm. need to find, how to find a contract writer, which I teach on how to do. You need to just, my, if you could do sales, you could do sales or put a, a short sales up in that place. And then you can literally automate the whole thing, run, run it on right C and make your money and not have to worry about anything. And mm -hmm. so that's essentially what I'm doing now. It's called the Art of Five Star Resume Writing. Um, it's available. It took about nine months to put together because I wanted to make sure that it was going to be like, you know, amazing for people to be able to jump in and I'll, and I'll learn this trade because it's a recession proof business, right? Um, people always need a job Thanks. and people always want to get a new job. They want to make more money. And the only way that they're going to break in and get that interview is having a, a quality resume. And so it's been around forever. It's the cornerstone of the recruitment market and staffing recruitment is in like the 300 billions. And so if you just think about that, it's like, all right, well, shoot, I don't got to you know, take out a loan to do this, you know, <laughs> uh, it's, it's really something where it's like, man, um, if there's a, if there's a potential, you got the hustle. I highly recommend just uh, checking it out. Mm, I love it. I love it. Um, so 
can we, we're going to pivot to the last section of the podcast, my brother. We'll pivot to what's on your timeline. So this is just a section we speak about, like, anything that you saw that was funny, serious, anything. uh Anything that you saw on your TL, you get a you could have read it. It doesn't just have to be from social media, but uh, anything that you would like to elaborate on. Uh man, I got so much funny things to say, but let me still try to keep it a little serious. Uh, you know, one of the key things that I, I think is crazy the topic to talk about, and uh, and I don't, I don't know if it's primarily race, but just like I think when the whole George Floyd thing happened. Um, and, uh, and rest in peace and, um, and you know, uh, big ups to his whole family, I hope they're still recovering. I just felt like the Black Lives Matter movement and just the push was great, but I feel like so many companies jumped on that bandwagon mm-hmm. to push like I'm pro-black, I'm whatever. It was just smoke screams. And I feel like now we're starting to see like nothing really changed. It was just like a marketing tactic. And I just want to talk yep. about like, it's just crazy how like, a lot of things can happen in the world and it will it'll like start a movement and people just get behind it, but they're not really behind it. Mm-hmm. And I think it was, um, it was, uh, one of these things that I saw, I know like one of the job boards, they had like changed like their front to like, say like, as soon as you hit the front page, it was like, we support black lives matter, but where is it at now? You know? Yeah, and it's like in, some of these, the some of these other companies like, Oh, we're pro this pro that. And it's like, where's it at now? So it's just crazy it took, for me. It's just like, I think that, on that topic, like we need to get smarter as like employees and just more cognizant as people like who's really supporting certain movements. And it's not just here to just show up and just to like protect their brand image and protect like their stuff. And, and I feel like that's something that's been on my mind. Like how could we, you know, hold people and companies accountable for actually promoting and um, supporting what they, where they say that they're going to support. I don't know how we do it, but it's something that's been on my mind. Like, yo, how could we, you know, I don't know whether it's like a forum or it's like a something or an issue that, that people could do to just essentially hold people accountable. Like if they said that they're behind something, because I feel like a lot of times it's just like, they just like fly by night, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was crazy too, like during that whole time, like I know like the Wells Fargo CEO came out and was like, um, we don't promote black professionals because there's a lack of talent. Man, they came for that man's ass, boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it was just crazy because it's like, there's not a lack of black talent y'all just not really promoting from within. You know what I'm saying? And so I just find it, I just find it absolutely crazy. And I hope that's something that in 2021, if there's any other big headlines, God forbid, and I hope there's not, and it starts and pushes our, our, our movement again, like that we can really, you know, have some like snapple facts and be like, nah, these people were really rocking with it. And like, to really hold people accountable for people who, who's actually not. Cause I feel that's crazy. And a lot of times like, and I, and I just say to say like, cause if I was still working at, you know, corporate world, and like my company came out and said some nonsense or didn't say nothing at all, I would feel some type of way. Mm, and I, I definitely agree with you. Uh, even just like with the black, hit, well, like even with Black History Month, just like seeing the way some companies like uh, reacting. I think there was like KFC, they put up a fucking chicken wing and then the, the silhouette of it was like the Black Power Fist talking about we're here with you. I was just like, it's all market, it's all performative shit. Like, yeah, there is. Like you were saying, Brandon, it's like everybody they they hopping on the wave, but they're not really truly. They're not really supporting. They just they bandwagon fans. They're not here for the long haul. If that's a good question to ask, though. How can we hold them more accountable? I feel like the only honest answer is hurt them the, pockets. But it, then certain companies, are you really going to hurt them pockets? <laughs> like you going you going to stop shopping at Amazon if they don't stop? They don't say nothing about Black Lives Matter. Like, hey man, hey, it's it's. Definitely a question though. Hey, yeah, it's not something thing like it's just so crazy to me. And I hope that like stuff like that gets better as we kind of push our, our, our people, you know, forward. Cause I feel like, and it's crazy because I'm just in that whole space, like careers and companies and employees just say, yo, we gotta really keep it going. I think that it's it's about like the unity. But yeah, man, that's that's what's been on my mind, like stuff like that. Like, how can we do that? And um also, you know, there's this there's a whole other thing too, like a lot of times when companies lay off people too. Like most nine times out of 10, you know, it's really like the low, the low class African-American or Latinos who get laid off first. So it's like, I just feel like we got to really be more cognizant on like what's really going on in the background, you know what I'm saying? And not just like taking place about because there's, there's, it's, it's dope to be a boss, but there's always going to be a lot more employees than there are bosses. You know what I'm saying? And so we just got to really realize. And I think that for me, it's like, 
we need to be, we need, we, we do need more CEOs like us to be able to um, put people in, in position and power. And I think that like, that's one of the craziest things. It's like, I think they did a study like looking at the Fortune 500 and that's like top tier, but like how many of those people is actually black running the company? I and I'm not saying you got a founder, like, but what? it's like 1% or like one out of all mm, the Yeah, like percent. I think it's like one. It's crazy. Nuts, but yeah. yeah. Crazy. Looking to, looking to make these changes definitely the service you doing is helping yeah. people level up within the career field. So you provide solutions. You're not just also thinking about it. You're helping it. So I could say I appreciate you in that regard, my brother. I try yeah, my, my best. And even, even the podcast, man, just coming on here and Black Wealth Renaissance be able to just provide this value to the people, I think is just critical. Critical, man. Nobody who's listening to this better take this, you know, we're, we're going to sell you, but a really deep dive, bring out your notebooks and really like soak up this information because that's how we move the culture together. You know what I'm saying? And I think it's just a shift. We should, everybody should be wealthy and they don't write. And that doesn't even need to be monetarily. It could be spiritually, it could be emotionally, it could be mentally, but you should be chasing a, a, a wealthy, you know, habit and just um, uh, lifestyle, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I love it. Hey, I just want to say thank you for coming yes, on the show, my brother. It's thank you for amazing. taking this time out your Saturday to kick it with us. Like I said, um, can you please plug yourself in? Let the uh, listeners know where can they follow you, find you, how can they tap, in, can they tap in, like all of for it. Sure, for sure, for sure. Now, for a fact. So uh, first things first, you can find me on Instagram at Brandon, B-R-A-N-D-O-N underscore the resume guru. I'm a posting content all the time on a lot of different things in employment industries. I do a tech career of the week. I kind of jump on, talk about deep dive into a, an actual tech topic. I follow the unemployment trends. Um, I'm always posting about careers, uh, tips and things like that. Um, you can follow the software company at the right. See if you're if you're a writer, if you're aspiring to be a writer, you might already could, could take, you know, kind of run with that. Or if you're interested in actually starting a resume business, I'm um, deep diving into what that looks like. Uh, it's it's uh, right at the link. The link is in my bio, but it's um, courses.brandresumes.com where you'll see all that's there. Um, it's, it's just there for everybody to kind of take advantage of. And if any questions, just hit me up in the DMs. I'm, I'm typically responsive or my assistant will definitely get to you. Um, but yeah, man, I'm just trying to, you know, just keep pushing the culture forward on LinkedIn, Brandon Mitchell, PNP CSM, because you put the certifications in there to, to find me. Um, but yeah, just that's where you can find me. Um, always available, always ready to help. And we're also doing a lot of workshops. So if you're listening to this and you work at a company that would like me to come in, do a workshop or do a seminar, we're doing that all throughout this this month into the, into all next months, things like that. Um, and if you are in a position of power, there's something called outplacement, which is if, you, if your organization ever has to lay off a massive amount of people, um, you can kind of hire a resume writing company or a career coaching company to come in and help them transition into a uh, new work. So. Definitely hit me up if that if that interests you. And uh, that's about it. Y'all get at my brother. Tap in. And we'll also have the link for that course if y'all want to learn. We have it in the show notes. Y'all yeah. can tap in with that too. Most definitely. Well, once again, Brandon, bro, I got to say thank you for coming on here and dropping these gems, my yeah. dog. Uh, before we wrap this thing up, we're going to hop into a couple house cleaning items. As always, everybody, thank y'all for tuning in to the Black Wolf Renaissance podcast. Please leave a rating and review if you enjoyed this episode. Um, yeah, man, this is, man, yeah, I, I ain't gonna lie, my brother just, yeah. Yeah, rating and review, once again, like I said earlier, if you're new here, hopefully you enjoyed this episode, um, and if you've been with us, thank you for rocking with us. Like I've been saying, man, we got a goal this year, we're trying to push past 20,000 listeners per episode in the first night, in the first 30 days, um, right now we were right about 12, 12,000, yeah. so we need y'all help, please share with all of your family and your friends, we got great content. And also, we're about to start releasing premium content so y'all can tap into the Patreon and y'all can hear all of the episodes. We got about 12 episodes in the vault. Um, so if you like, if you're loving what you hear, you'll be able to access some of these uh, episodes before exclusive. they even drop. Um, we'll have some exclusive episodes that will not be releasing on all platforms. It will only be on Patreon. So y'all definitely, definitely tap into that. Um, and with that being said, this is Black Off Renaissance signing out. Peace. I got money on my mind. I'm just trying to get some dough. I ain't picking up my lot unless it's money on the phone.